So finally, what to do about it? I hope that one of the main takeaways of this course is that technology does not automatically and deterministically lead to one certain outcome. It's not like technology is automatically good or inherently bad. Technology has an outcome, uh, but it is just one out of many possible outcomes. Technology is just a tool. Think about the hammer. A hammer is a very useful, indispensable tool if you want to build a house or you need at least something equivalent to a hammer to drive in a nail and hang up a picture. But everything that you can use to drive in a nail can also be used to hurt people. So is a hammer good or bad? That's actually the wrong question you to ask. So and if you ask people if communication technology made the world a better or worse place, what you will find is that there are also very divided opinions about it. So in a recent survey, uh, half of the people said the technology made the world a better place. A significant number said it made it a worse place. And one in three people said it's neither better nor worse. It is just different. And this leads us to this third dimension of our three-dimensional framework. We first started with the requisites for digitalization and then with the arising opportunities that come out of digitalization, opportunities with regard to modernization of different sectors. And third of all, now we have the dimension of policies and strategies that we use to shape and guide this process through different kinds of feedback. While I was working at the United Nations Secretariat, we used this cube a lot to work with countries to set up these kind of policy and strategy agendas. And all countries around the world, big or small, have some kind of digital action plan, digital strategy agenda by now that is aimed at helping this country to go forward in this transition towards the digital age. And if you work with different countries, the cube changes a little bit. There are different priorities. For example, uh, in the digital ICT agenda of Chile, you can see that the priorities are finance, education, defense, and justice. Now, I found over the years that one very good way of really analyzing policy agenda is to simply look where the public sector, the government, puts its money. It doesn't always put its money where its mouth is. Uh, but if you look at the money, you know what really matters to them. So if you look at the Chilean digital agenda, we can see that most of the money allocated is invested into finance. For example, in back in these days, it was in the digitalization of the tax paying mechanism or the databases and the finance ministry were being digitalized. So that's actually part of e-government. Then the education sector received a lot of money. They bought a lot of computers for schools. Uh, the defense budget, of course, very important, very intensive in ICT spending, the Justice Department. And then there were others. It keeps on going. There's, for example, the Health uh, Department as well got, uh, got, uh, got, uh, got a significant amount of money. You can also cut the cake differently, and that's why the cube is so useful. You can look at it from different perspectives. For example, now we can look at the horizontal layer, the requisite layers. And there we can see that the Chilean government invested 16% of its money into infrastructure development, that is the setting up of public access centers, the installation of more broadband infrastructure. Now, the biggest amount of money was invested in generic services, in the development of software programs and apps, for example, in this tax paying application. And every third dollar was invested into training initiatives. So there you have your 100%, 16, 52, and uh, 32. And you can now play around with the cube and analyze actually where is the money going. And that helps also the government to see where its priorities are and where it wants to intervene. Actively spending money and investing is one way you can do policy. The other way is you write laws and regulation, which not necessarily involves money. For example, a hotly debated kind of regulation nowadays has to do with privacy and the data sharing policies. This policy is focused on the generic service sector. It focuses at 
applications like social media networks, for example, and it affects all kind of e-sectors. Once you have a regulation like this in place, it affects e-business, e-government, e-culture, e-education, and so forth. So it has a cross-cutting nature. For example, I'm completely convinced that you are absolutely aware of the regulation with regard to the property rights of the content on Facebook. Who owns the property rights of your picture after you posted it on Facebook? At the time of the recording of this video, the terms of service of Facebook stated that you grant Facebook a non-exclusive, transferable, sub-licensable, royalty-free, worldwide license to use any intellectual property content content that you post. That means as soon as you post a picture, Facebook has the right even to sell it to other people and doesn't have an obligation to pay you for it. But these kind of property rights are also changing all the time. The companies themselves are changing them and the governmental regulations with regard to them is constantly changing. For example, if you compare the default data sharing settings of Facebook during its first 10 years of existence, you will notice that in 2005, the default setting was that only you and your friends were able to see who are your friends. And only you and your friends were able to see your basic profile data. However, 10 years later, the default setting, that means if you didn't change anything actively, then the default setting says that the entire internet is able to see who are your friends and what is your basic profile data. So many people are currently confused about this data sharing policy and companies are changing their practices all the time. And this is a typical area where we can now use policy in order to guide it towards the outcome that we have in mind. And this is a very hotly debated and very delicate topic of discussion. Um, so for example, the United States government came out with a report called Big Data and Privacy, where they laid out their way to deal with it for the future. And literally, they say that policy attention should focus more on the actual uses of big data and less on its collection and analysis. So what that means in plain English is that they say, look, the genie's out of the bottle. We have no way how to control for who collects and analyzes data. It's just, we just say, let's let everybody grab whatever they can. Everybody can grab everybody's data and analyze it. However, if you misuse it, and or abuse the data, then the force of the law will come down on you and we will punish you. That's the way how to go about it. And for example, the United States government uh, deals the same way with gun control, for example. Basically, the law says that everybody in general can have a gun. However, if you misuse it, if you kill somebody not rightfully, then you will be punished. And that's what they are proposing now as well. Uh, to deal like that with, with data sharing policy. Now, uh, think about yourself. So for example, that means that every one of your future employers can search whatever they want about you. Every data they can get their hand on and the government won't even control if they opt how they obtain the data and so forth. They say, well, collection analysis, we cannot, we cannot control that anymore. They can get whatever they can get by whatever means. However, if they use it to discriminate you, that means if they wouldn't give you the job because of your skin color or because they find out about your sexual orientation, this would be against the law and therefore then they would uh, punish this employer. The obvious question is, well, how do we find out that actually this employer used the data of social networks in order to, well, the employer surely will have a different excuse, say you are not the right person, you're not qualified. So it's a very funny and tricky issue. And in, the, in this report, it's also said that especially in a country uh, like the United States with a long history of discrimination, that is a very delicate issue to deal with. So there are a lot of ways how to go about it. There's also not a right or wrong. It's basically of what we've 
think is important and that's what policy is always about. So we have to find as a society an, a vision of where we want to go in the digital age and then find policy options in order to implement that. Technology itself is just a tool. It's not inherently good or bad. It needs to be socially constructed and our generation has the luck or the responsibility to shape the transition towards the digital age.